Good evening. I'm Carla Hayden, Librarian of Congress, and I want to welcome you to the 2020 Library of Congress Levine Ken Burns Prize for Film Awards Ceremony. We have a wonderful evening in store for you. But first, I want to welcome the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and Senator Lamar Alexander. Good evening. As Speaker of the House, it is my honor to welcome you to the Library of Congress Levine Ken Burns Prize for Film Awards Ceremony. We are about to enjoy a very special hour together, but before we do, I wish to say thank you to the People's Library, to the brilliant Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, and to Ken Burns for the work they have done for so many years preserving and promoting our history. And a special thanks goes to the Better Angel Society and the phenomenal Jonathan and Je Jeannie Levine for creating this wonderful prize and for their unwavering support for filmmakers like Ken Burns and all those committed to telling America's stories. The Library of Congress is a beloved institution dedicated to ensuring the treasures of American history and culture in its care are available to all. With the creation of the Levine Ken Burns Prize for Film, the library is now highlighting the power of history, documentary filmmaking, to educate, inspire, and challenge our understanding of the past while celebrating our values and moving our nation forward. On behalf of the United States Congress, congratulations to all of tonight's honorees, and thank you to all who have made this celebration possible. Now please enjoy the evening. Good evening, I'm Senator Lamar Alexander of Tennessee, and like all of you, I'm a fan of Ken Burns. We've watched and admired Ken's remarkable range of documentaries, the Civil War, baseball, jazz, so many more. And my fellow Tennesseans and I have a special appreciation for Ken's masterful and moving history of country music. What all of these works have in common is a passion to tell America's story in a memorable, accessible way that helps us understand and appreciate the country in which we live. This is history. This is education at its finest. And we've been fortunate to have Ken as America's preeminent storyteller for more than 40 years. One could even argue that Ken Burns is our most effective teacher of United States history, a subject woefully undertaught in our schools. While Ken has discovered his own personal fountain of youth and has an ambitious production schedule, including a major production on the American Revolution just in time for its 250th anniversary, He's also begun to think about the next generation of great documentary filmmakers. With a Levine Ken Burns Prize for Film, Ken is welcoming and nurturing these rising stars in partnership with Jeannie and Jonathan Levine, the Better Angels Society, and the best partner any historian could hope for, the Library of Congress. So here to tell you more is that exceptional librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Thank you, Speaker Pelosi and Senator Alexander. Last year, the Library of Congress partnered with the Better Angel Society, Jonathan and Jeannie Levine, and Ken Burns to establish an official prize of the Library of Congress, recognizing excellence in American history documentary filmmaking in the model of Ken Burns filmmaking that is painstakingly researched, rich in archival materials, ideologically balanced, and focusing on inclusive American stories. And here we are, already in our second year. We could never have known how prescient and how important this prize would be in the context of 2020. We could never have known that our very democracy would become the subject of national scrutiny and widespread protest, and that history, specifically in the form of documentary film, would be vital to informing that scrutiny and empowering the civil discourse sparked by the protests. What we did know last year and what endures is that the Library of Congress is one of the world's greatest repositories of the real tangible stuff of humanity and history, not just books, but photographs, moving images, recorded musical performances, sound recordings, documents, maps, records, and so much more. What we want more Americans to know is that a great part of the Library of Congress's collection is free and accessible to everyone, 
wherever they may be through digital technology. Every single item in our collection is a story waiting to be told. And this is something Ken Burns has known since the start of his career. The films of Ken Burns and the films of the lesser known documentarians telling America's stories recognized here tonight take archival materials like ours at the Library of Congress and use them as their artistic medium. They see the stuff of archives as remnants of the fabric of American history, then sew them together into beautiful new quilts that take the form of film narratives. In this way, their documentaries bring untold stories to life in the richest possible way with historic film footage, sound recordings, and original documents. The films celebrated tonight amplify the unheard American voices and shine a light on uniquely American experiences that help us understand our past, reconcile our present, and navigate our future. Tonight, through the Library of Congress and at the bequest of the Levines, we award $200,000 to one winner late stage film project to use for finishing, distribution, and promotion. The Better Angel Society supplements this by awarding one runner up $50,000 and four finalists each $25,000. These funds are sorely needed by these filmmakers so that they can bring their films to a wider audience. And none of this would have been possible without the incredible generosity of Jeannie and Jonathan Levine, who had the wisdom and the willingness to see that an understanding of history is critical to understanding our world today, the challenges, the promises, and the choices we have. They recognize that these documentary films may be about the past, but they are the way of the future when it comes to how the next generation of Americans will learn their history. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear from Jeannie and Jonathan Levine. Thank you, Dr. Hayden. Some years ago, Jeannie and I made it our goal to support nonprofits that focus on leveling the playing field for individuals and families. This includes democratization of education and information. This year, the pandemic has further exposed how uneven the playing field in this country. So our goal is more ambitious and more urgent than ever. Our country's history is not simple. It is contentious, as we have seen in the past year. But we must explore that complexity. We are better citizens when we discuss the past, try to learn, and make decisions that are informed by facts and critical thinking. As films by Ken Burns remind us, the act of remembering and thinking about history is itself unifying. Ken's particular brand of historical documentary filmmaking attracted us because it is steeped in storytelling trying to understand people's unique experiences and presenting them in the context of what we know about the period. He and his team present different perspectives in a well-rounded way, and in doing so, let the viewers draw their own conclusions from a more informed place of reckoning. Now we see that this style of documentary film is not only important, but vital to our democracy and one of the best ways to level the playing field. A few years ago, when we supported Ken's Vietnam War series through the Better Angel Society, we saw firsthand people coming together in the best possible ways. We saw veterans and protesters applauding one another. We saw Vietnamese Americans standing up in their communities and leading discussions. We saw teachers finding joy in the quest to inspire their students. We saw young adults understanding the music and even the attitudes of their parents in new ways. And best of all, we saw soldiers who had been at war with themselves find peace. All of this is a testament to the power of film when it lifts up history and makes it a common ground, and we wanted to do more. Ken's films have been the gold standard for decades and will continue to be, but encouraging and supporting more filmmakers telling America's stories in a thoroughly researched and balanced way makes it possible for important but marginalized, underrecognized, and misunderstood stories to reach Americans on their laptops and in their living rooms. Jonathan and I were thrilled to see that more filmmakers are looking to history for inspiration and creating enduring works of art using yesterday's footage, photos, and songs. Congratulations to each and every winner.
Soon we will hear from our dear friend, Ken Burns, the filmmaker who helped create the form we are all celebrating tonight. But first, we also want to thank fellow Better Angels, Meredith DeWitt, Courtney Chapin, and Amy Berg for their leadership in putting this event together. Now I am proud to introduce Ken's long-term collaborator, Lynn Novick, an award-winning filmmaker in her own right, who plays an important role in our selection process as chair of the Internal Review Committee. Ladies and gentlemen, Lynn Novick. Thank you, Jonathan and Jeannie. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lynn Novick. For two years now, I've had the honor of convening a distinguished committee of film experts from the Library of Congress and filmmaker colleagues from Florentine Films to review this prize's top-ranking submissions and recommend the finalists to the national jury. Thanks to the Better Angel Society, the Library of Congress, and the Levines, the community of documentary filmmakers who explore American history is growing stronger, and their films are better appreciated as a result of this competition. Before Ken and Dr. Hayden tell us about this year's winners, we are thrilled to offer you all a sneak peek and a documentary miniseries Ken and I are just now completing about Ernest Hemingway, the brilliant and complicated writer who remade American literature. Our film will air and stream nationally on PBS next April. As tonight we come together to honor great storytelling, we chose a clip about one of Hemingway's masterpieces, his 1929 novel, A Farewell to Arms. Enjoy. In the novel, Lieutenant Henry deserts and flees to neutral Switzerland with Catherine Barclay. They hope to marry and build a life together once the war is over. She is pregnant. But something goes terribly wrong in the delivery room. Doctors perform a cesarean. The baby is stillborn. Catherine's life ebbs away. Hemingway agonized over the ending, writing 47 versions of the final pages before he was satisfied. I went to the door of the room. You can't come in now, one of the nurses said. Yes, I can, I said. You can't come in yet. You get out, I said, the other one too. But after I had got them out and shut the door and turned off the light, it wasn't any good. It was like saying goodbye to a statue. After a while, I went out, left the hospital, and walked back to the hotel in the rain. Parts of A Farewell to Arms could have been written by a woman. Now, I regard that as a compliment. Hemingway might regard it as an insult, but I don't, because it is the androgyny in a man or a woman that allows them, even if briefly, not utterly, to be able to put themselves inside the skin of the opposite thing. In many ways, I think it's his greatest novel. I do. It's the truest. It's also heartbreaking. I remember crying and crying and crying. He gets the, all the the boy's stuff, the man's stuff, he gets the horror of the war. But when people put that book down, what do they remember? They remember a woman dying in childbirth. If people bring so much courage to this world, the world has to kill them to break them. So of course, it kills them. The world breaks everyone. And afterward, many are strong at the broken places. But those that will not break, it kills. It kills the very good and the very gentle and the very brave impartially. If you are none of these, you can be sure it will kill you too. But there will be no special hurry.
Good evening, everyone. I'm so sorry that we cannot be together in person, but I am nonetheless extraordinarily thankful that we have an opportunity to meet at least in this way. Thank you, Dr. Hayden, for bringing the distinction of the Library of Congress to this award, and thank you, Jonathan and Jeannie, for making it possible. When I started making films, I made a pilgrimage of sorts to the Library of Congress. As Dr. Hayden said so well, it was and still is a sort of shrine to all it is to be human. I stood there in the main reading room with its huge, immense ceiling and vaulted windows intoxicated by the power of the past. There's a feeling that we all get when we step into a space that so reverently and so compellingly captures who we are as a people, whether it's a historic site or a magnificent public space. It's why, throughout the ages, mankind has always built lofty structures to house history, and we are no different, especially today when it is so hard to step into these places. Thanks to the Library of Congress's foresight and commitment to digital technology, Americans, wherever they are, can access our nation's historic archives online. The Library of Congress is home to our history. It is the oral history of men and women who could not read or write. It is the early music performed by artists who were self-taught and invented new art forms. It is the early history of film. It is thousands upon thousands of images that capture who we were at any given period in our past since the advent of photography only 160 plus years ago. It is the tangible evidence of our collective experience, which, along with other materials known and newly discovered, we history filmmakers use to tell the stories of who we are. The winning films we are celebrating tonight take archival moving images, sound recordings, photographs, and documents found in archives like the Library of Congress's collection, and through them bring the past to life. Somehow using the past as their medium this way, the filmmakers make it possible for us to see ourselves and know who we are as individuals and as a nation more clearly. And perhaps most important, I believe excellent films like these play an increasingly important role in helping us navigate a future where we are less divided and more empathetic. Before we announce this year's finalists and winner, let me share a little bit about the selection process. This is an annual prize that accepts late-stage American history film submissions between February and June. The semifinalists are chosen through a careful, multi-tiered process that spans more than six months. This year, more than 150 submissions were received. As you already heard from Lynn Novick, the Internal Review Committee reviewed many strong submissions and recommended a select subset to the national jury, which is chaired by Dr. Hayden, who in turn discussed the two finalists with me before choosing a winner. We are also endorsed by an illustrious honorary committee whose members lend their names and their public profiles to the Library of Congress Levine Ken Burns Prize for Film helping to promote greater appreciation for the art of American history documentary filmmaking. Let's take a look at the jury and honorary committee members now. Before we hear from Dr. Hayden about tonight's winner, let's take a moment to recognize the four finalists and runners up. If you were gay in those days, you were diagnosed as suffering from a mental disorder. Like so many people in my generation, I went to psychoanalysis to be cured. The body of knowledge which claims sickness for homosexuality has to be challenged. We could not expect our civil rights as long as we were burdened with the sickness label. Maybe it makes you feel good to be able to say that we are sick. Does it make you feel no, good? There were so many of us that were at the same point. Enough is enough. We're not going to take it anymore. We dress up and go down Jackson Street. We couldn't go out on the strip, so that was our strip. 1955, there was a casino here called the Moulin Rouge that was opened and it was the first integrated hotel casino. 
Moulin Rouge was as elegant as the Sands, the Desert Inn, but a lot of entertainers went over there. People like Sammy Davis Jr., Lena Horne, Nat King Cole. We're heading south on the Larson Ice Shelf. Ski pole on one hand, tape recorder on the other. Pretty below. Uh, just a pristine morning. It's incredibly clear and beautiful. I traveled in the polar regions for 50 years of my life. My first 25 years was before the changes. In the last 25 years, I, I've seen all the changes. As soon as we got there, we had heard rumblings that Mrs. Mao had expressed disfavor at Beethoven's Fifth. The Fifth is about the fate. Communists don't believe fate. I said, Maestro, there's a strong request from the top to play Beethoven's Sixth, the pastoral symphony. And he looked at me, he said, well, you know I hate that symphony, and I didn't bring any scores. We are a positive people. We are a progressive people. We're not anti-anything but evil. We're not anti-anything but racism. We're not anti-anything but hatred. We're not against people. We are for people. And having said that, it's our turn, it's our turn, it's our turn. What an incredible spectrum of American stories our finalist films bring to life, and each one is as much about yesterday as it is about today. They're stories that bring us to that common ground of history, where we come together on equal footing and are prompted to think in new ways about things we struggle with now, like human rights, climate change, social justice, and more. All receive funding from the Better Angel Society to help them finish their projects and hopefully to advance their distribution over the coming year. Before I announce this year's winner, I'm proud to tell you that this year, Jeannie and Jonathan Levine, through the Better Angel Society, have provided additional support to establish the Better Angels Levine Fellowship. This is a new mentorship program designed for emerging filmmakers whose promising projects, selected from those who submit their films to be considered for this prize, focus on America's inclusive voices and diverse stories. Learn more on our website, loc.gov. Now, what we've all been waiting for, the announcement of our 2020 Library of Congress Levine Ken Burns Prize for film-winning documentary. Ken and I, our jury, and all those who take part in the selection process were blown away by this riveting film, which takes us back to New York City in 1973, where racial division and the complicated and often confusing relationship between the city, its citizens, and its police force could not be more relevant to the challenges facing our nation today. Ken Burns has talked about the lessons of history throughout his long and storied career, and this film certainly offers us a host of valuable lessons. I know all of you at home join me in congratulating Stefan Forbes and his team for their exceptional work creating Hold Your Fire, winner of the 2020 Library of Congress Levine Ken Burns Prize for Film. Let's take a look and we'll hear from Mr. Forbes after this brief clip. There were 
are more indications today that peace is coming to Vietnam. We'll have reports on that from Saigon and Paris. But first, a story of violence inside a sporting goods store in Brooklyn. Four terrorists had been surprised inside the store on Friday afternoon when police arrived in response to a robbery alarm. I was floored. The police wanted me, their enemy, to help. I had just finished the Panther 21 case, which had as its main allegation uh, blowing up police precincts. I don't know if I would have gone there if I knew I was going to be put into a tank and wheeled up in front of the store. I was being fired upon. It's just so scary. Ten hostages in that store who could be mowed down at any minute. Hordes of press wanting to find out what it's all about. And they never get it. What we didn't learn is why these four young guys were there. This was the Titanic, the moon landing. I'm never going to forget the siege. It's, it's permanently etched in your, in, your, in your heart and in your soul. The lessons learned of this case is so revolutionary for law enforcement. If you can't reason with the person and have a meaningful dialogue, this is not going to end without a bloodbath. Thank you so, so much for this incredible award. Can't tell you what an honor it is to be here with these other projects, which look amazing, relevant, and urgent. And this is really going to be the first time in six years that my producers, Tia Wu, Amir Soltani, and I can look at our timeline and see this amazing film footage and not have to think, oh, $85 a second. At a minute, it's going to be over $5,000 just to tell this story. Uh, maybe we should just go to the Library of Congress and try to get some pictures for free. Thank God for them. Thank you so much to the Levines, to the Better Angels Foundation, to Dr. Carla Hayden, my new hero, to Ken Burns, and to the Library of Congress for implicitly recognizing the incredible barriers to entry for any independent filmmakers trying to tell this kind of story, these historical films, when we don't have the backing, the enormous amount of research that goes into this. And I think a lot of filmmakers coming up now really want to tell these stories in a more Studs Terkelian, Zora Neale Hurstonian way, where we want to privilege a lot of voices. We want to take a much wider lens look at American history and really let regular people be part of telling their stories. And this kind of grant is really crucial to accomplishing that. Um, ever since the caveman days, it's the stories that have been unifying us as people. And this important, amazing award is going to let a much wider amount of people come in around the campfire and get the chance to look at our history and see it from a, a wider perspective. Thank you so, so much. I can't tell you how much I look forward to holding this check in my hand for about three seconds before sending it off to the networks to pay for our footage with a song in my heart because uh, I know now that we'll actually finally get to finish this film. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stefan, on your great work. What an honor it is to be part of this prize. Congratulations again to Hold Your Fire and all the finalists. We look forward to seeing these amazing American stories airing and streaming across the country in the future. To find out more about the Library of Congress Levine Ken Burns Prize for Film 2020 winners, go to thebetterangelsociety.org or loc.gov. Now, as this part of the award ceremony draws to a close, we're going to move to a discussion moderated by Dr. Hayden with the great Wynton Marsalis. 
Before we do that, let's look back to our performance at Lincoln Center, where I had the great honor to join Winton, his band, and the legendary Marty Stewart. It's my great pleasure to introduce the astonishing Marty Stewart, who grew up in Mississippi, not far from Jimmy Rogers' hometown, to perform Doug Womble's arrangement of Blue Yodel No. 9 with the musical descendant of Louis Armstrong, Wynton Marsalis. Thank you, Ken Burns. Uh, if you check the record for the past 15 or 20 years I was telling Winton yesterday, I played with most everybody I wanted to since I was a kid. And uh, they've always asked, who would you like to perform with that you've never played with? In every single interview, I've said, Winton Marsalis. It's an honor to be in your house with your orchestra. And uh, if there ever was a song that gives license for us to be here tonight. It is standing on the corner, Blue Yodel number nine. When Mr. Armstrong and Mr. Jimmy Rogers got together to perform that, it laid waste to all boundaries. And uh, they were just doing what they did. They, they loved it. And watching Ken's films, uh, it's made me homesick for a lot of the people that I love that were a part of my young life. Johnny Cash being one of them. And when I first went to work in his band, it took me about three seconds to realize his sense of humor was dark as his clothes. <laughs> and if you know Jimmy Rogers' story, he passed away in this town at the Taft Hotel. And right after I went to work with John, we flew through here and went to LaGuardia one day. He said, come on, we've got to take care of something. And I found out that he had a ritual. Every time he would come through New York City, he would call the Taft Hotel and say, this is Johnny Cash, can I speak to Jimmy Rogers? Tell him I called. He wink at me. And one day he said, let's go call Jimmy Rogers. So, uh, hello, this is Johnny Cash. Can I speak to Jimmy Rogers? And he went, and he hung up. He said, he answered. <laughs> <laughs> so he never called again. So, Mr. Marsalis. Paid a hundred cash dollars for me. 
me a new suit of clothes She came to the joint A 44 in each hand so Step aside you hound dog I'm looking for my man And I said Well you find my name On the tail of my shirt I'm a Tennessee hustler I don't have to work Yodel Mr. Marcellus and Marty Stewart. Marty has been a longtime supporter of the Library of Congress, and we appreciate his talent and his contribution to music everywhere. And we've just celebrated a new crop of amazing documentaries and the winners of the Library of Congress Levine Ken Burns Prize, and a great clip from the Lincoln Center, where both of you. Mr. Marcellus and Ken Burns collaborated to celebrate country music. So I have to start out by asking, why is a celebrated jazz oh, musician is just, you know, celebrated person in jazz and a celebrated documentary filmmaker, how did you come together and form this partnership? Well, let me take a crack at that. Um, we have known each other and we've been working together for 30 years. And at the heart of it, I think, is recognition. We saw each other. I was given a talk. Winton was in the front row. He heard me. And afterwards, I realized that he had heard me. And I think that's what all of this is about, a kind of investigation into areas that are mysterious, that have to do with discipline and have to do with practice. And we just saw each other. And the first thing we did was to work on a big history of jazz music. But Winton and I have collaborated on many other subjects far beyond jazz. And it's continuing that same relationship, the need to sort of express uh, what we have both to express individually and collectively about American history, about the American experience across a wide range of things. And I think when it gets to country music, um, only commerce and convenience suggests that we should in silo each music branch and presume that only a certain people listen to country music, only a certain people listen to jazz, only a certain people listen to soul or rock or folk or whatever it is, when in fact there are no borders. Everybody's listening to everybody else and everybody's being influenced by everybody else. And we learn in country music of the extraordinary African-American um, uh, influence on the early stars from Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family to Johnny Cash and Hank Williams and Bill Monroe, the founder of Bluegrass. And it just seemed logical that we would want to go to Winton and ask him a little bit about what is shared in common? What is it that you hear? What is recognized? Back to that same word. And so um, it's he was a huge, huge part, is a huge part of the, of our country music series. And when you said, uh, Ken just said that you heard him, you were listening to him. What was <laughs> it that resonated with you listening to Ken? Well, this was a lecture he was given at the uh, at the at the Metropolitan Museum, and 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 just his obvious genius. Then I was I was almost thirty, I think. So we were we were young at that time, mm -hmm. and uh, he's never he doesn't grow older. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. I've lost my voice, but um, it's just his obvious genius, his engagement with with the United States of America and with fairness and equality, uh, the depth of his macro vision and his micro. Usually have somebody with a big macro vision, they're not going to do all the meticulous detail work. Uh, he obviously would do both. Uh, his integrity as a man, uh, I was attracted to it. And uh, just the clarity that he was expressing, his vision, and also the courage. And um, so, so I, I went back and I talked with him and I, I sought out the opportunity uh, to, to, to talk with him and meet him. And of course, down through these years, I'm such a fan of his and the fantastic work that he's done. Everything he touches, he just uh, does a magnificent job and it's, it's transformed how generations of people interact with history. 
not just American history, because his, his series go all over the world. I go places, I'll be in Australia and Japan, and people will have the jazz series, or they will be talking about baseball, or they want to know, what do I think about his take on, on, on Vietnam and the Roosevelt? So to have something that intelligent and well-crafted uh, in this time, it's been an honor for me to, to know him. And I, I love him very deeply, have tremendous respect for him. And it's just great to be with somebody you respect like that and you don't have to be fake. You know, it's like, we, we've worked on a lot of stuff, you know, we argue about stuff or we this or we that, but I, I have tre tremendous uh, respect and uh, I, I'm always waiting for the next thing that he's gonna do. I think we're all waiting on that. And I think there are several <laughs> things, Ken, that you have in the yeah. hopper. And this, the theme that's coming <clears throat> through and listening to uh, both of you describe your relationship, it's not unlikely when you think about the, the qualities that you both have described, the meticulous preparation, uh, the truth telling, the telling, those things are weaving in for both of you. And then with the jazz at the Lincoln Center, that you both are involved at that. Right. Well, Ken has always been in there with us, you know, and, and, and with the arts in America in general, most of us know each other by the time we get to be a certain age. We've seen Yo-Yo Ma, Renee Fleming, and we have a, a circuit that we all have known each other. And we started very young, wanting to fight for a certain vision of our country. And we've had some victories and we've had defeats but we all work for and with each other because we're, we're all working on the same thing. I always tell him when he wins prizes, if I can, if I can introduce him, I love doing it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and we, th those of us who are involved, Marty Stewart, I met Marty years ago. You know, Marty came on my bus with a septet and he had a book of, he was talking about country music. This is, this is 20, 25, 27 years ago also. And uh, he went to the next city with us and you know, Marty is great, an unbelievable musician. And, and all of our vernacular, all of our music is we're coming from the same source. And I think that's what Ken says repeatedly in his films, but in, in not just about America, but our it's, it's a universal humanism uh, that we all deeply believe in. And, and we'll do uh, whatever it is we need to do to, to bring the world more in that direction. And Ken, that's one of the main themes <clears throat> of all of your storytelling in, in your films. Right. Well, you know, I think that that I've chosen American history um, the way a painter might choose uh, oil as opposed to watercolor or still life as opposed to landscape or why someone might be a jazz musician or Marty might choose this. It's, it's sort of the place where it seemed uh, honorable and also real for me to try to practice whatever it is. And I'm a journeyman, actually. I work really hard, but I'm a journeyman. This guy here is like the Babe Ruth of, of his- Don't listen to that. Don't do this. <laughs> Don't do this kind of stuff. Be for real. Stop this. What, I, what, I, what I've learned- <laughs> Stop this. I might chime in, sir. Uh, Don't worry. Stop this, man. Stop this. What I learned from Winton is a kind of ferocity. And I think you have to have that- ferociousness about what the subject is and, and how you're going to tackle it and, and, and what you're going to do. So what I look at history and it's mostly made up of the word story plus high, which is a good introduction. Hello, you know, here I am. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is what we can start. And then we're gonna start to build these stories together. And what you find across all of the landscape of American history is not just one line, but all of these deep, complicated rifts that are happening that are recurring and, re and, and and not repeating but you hear these themes and motifs all the time and and what you do and I think what Winton was speaking about is that we tend to gravitate to the people in our fields and in other fields who hear and listen to these similarities it's back to this word recognition you know and and I think what happens is that we go in you know say I go to Winton I said well, we're making this film about this boxer Jack Johnson and we need this or we're doing a film about World War II and 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 we're trying to tell it from the bottom up as well as the top down and we've got four different geographically distributed American towns and we need to have these towns identified not just visually and not just orally as we speak a narration or somebody brings it up, but it's got to have a musical thing. And Winton has always said, and he says it so well in country music, that, that music is the art of the invisible. And 
And it, it was almost as if you're hearing something new again. Of course, it's the art of the invisible, but we don't think of it that way. We think of it as an art form and it's the fastest of all the art forms. You know, you hear two notes, maybe in the case of Count Basie, maybe you hear one note man, and you know what's happening, you know, plink, and it's just fantastic. And so music becomes, my brother who, who makes documentary films said to me, we're in discussion. He said, you know, when we're in the editing room, we're always using musical terms. We're always saying, hold that a beat longer, you know, get to the end of the phrase, all of this stuff. We don't really know what we're talking about musically, but we feel that. And he said to me, you know, I think that, that film, um, when it dies and goes to heaven, aspires to be music. And I think all of it goes back, whatever it is, uh, to music. And so the, the extent to which music uplifts film and helps carry and bear a story, not necessarily wedded to the rational, where one and one always equals two, but to some other magical uh, equation where one and one equals three. And that's what he's looking for. That's what my brother is looking for. That's what my brother Winton is looking for, is just that sort of impossible equation when one and one equals three. And, and we find it with each other and we find it in this work and we find it together and in association with each other. That's what, you know, the U.S. is about. It's, it's about the United States, but it's also about us, the two letter lowercase right. personal pronoun. Plural. And it touches people as you're talking and both of you are talking, you, it seems that part of what you're trying to do is to connect with people or get some right. emotion. Right. I think and we, we, you're trying to connect with yourself first. Ah. And then after you connect with yourself. But, you know, for for me, like I, I, I look at his films and I'll be uh, I'll, I'll be be I'm moved by so much of what's was in so many of them. And they have seen his canon unfold in this time has been a great pleasure for me. And it's it's not it's rare to get great artists of, of, of a of a certain caliber because the sacrifice is so great, and especially over time you just get worn down. But him, he doesn't get tired. He gets younger and more enthusiastic. So, yet it, it, it's 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 a it's a thing of beauty. And in terms of music, music is connected to things like memory, <clears throat> dreams, aspirations. So when, when, when Ken says one plus one equals three, we're always ever saying when we're playing, he says, it's, it's me, it's you, and then it's me and you. So that's the three. Me, you, and me and you. And uh, the me and you part is expanded when you, when you, when you are, are very much uh, view, viewer oriented. Like I, I noticed watching him put a film together, he, he goes through, he has so much outline. He might say, oh, it took us, eight years to do this. And you think, yes, eight years, but y'all spent seven years not doing it, a year doing it. No, <laughs> they spent eight years. Mm -hmm. So he's he goes through every frame, every interview, every cut, everything is unbelievable, like the, um, the amount of detail. And then he's always thinking, what will this make people feel? How can we go back to this? What is the impact of this? We need something that's more, we need this line. Yeah, what I really love about his way of, of doing his art is that he thinks about people. It's like I was reading a Beethoven sketchbooks years ago with his, his assistant was a guy named Reese. And, and by this stage of Beethoven's life, people were not really listening to his music the way he wanted them to. It's very intricate music, but in the sketchbook, Beethoven is writing things like, wait till they hear this, or you know, wait till he still has the, the desire to touch people and to, to wait till they hear this, this device or this effect that I'm gonna put right here. Or, or in a, I think that that type of humility is very important, especially when you have really dedicated, really great people who are really concentrated and focused over a long amount of time and have received accolades and recognition and they reach a certain point in the culture. I mean, Beethoven, by the time he was in his late forties, people knew who he was. It wasn't a question of what he was gonna be, but he was still hungry like a, like a, younger, like a young person, like an 18 year old, and, and also hungry to touch people and to give them unique experiences. And I think that's the thing that Ken has always had. And I think that's the beautiful thing that comes out not just in country music and all the films. And I think that's the beautiful thing about someone like Marty 
you know, Marty walks into a room and now you're having a good time. <laughs> so, you know, it just, you you sitting in your room now, hit this guy walks in and he has an instrument and something else completely different is going on. And he is the special effect. Right, mm -hmm. that's exactly right. And Winton's right, this is, um, about knowing yourself first. I mean, Tolstoy said that art is the transfer of emotion from one person to the next. And that's what it is. But you, that can't begin until you've done some internal work. And so I think what's, what, what Winton and I are so lucky is that very early on in our life, we knew what we were supposed to be doing and we knew who we wanted to talk to and we knew, um, if not what we were gonna say, we knew that we had to search in this certain way with this certain discipline and this certain diligence and to associate ourselves with the kind of people who were gonna serve that. They weren't gonna waste your time. They were gonna serve um, what you were going to do. And then it was going to be a collective. It wasn't just gonna be me. It was going, it's not just Winton. It's, it's the jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra. It's the extraordinary people that I've worked with in some cases like Winton for decades and decades. Jeffrey Ward, Lynn yes. Novick, Dayton Duncan. My this, man, that's right. This, this, we, we can't see this as a singular artistic thing. It's not like Van Gogh, um, you know, uh, putting a, a brushstroke on, on the canvas. It's, it's really a collective thing and what a glorious, um, wonderful thing it is when that works. And so if you can create a culture uh, as Winton has done at Jazz at Lincoln Center, if you can create, as we hope we've done at Florentine Films, a place where we can come together and say, look, this is gonna take us 10 and a half years to do this Vietnam thing. And we're, gonna, we're just gonna get it right. We're gonna just do this and we're not gonna let it go until it's right. And we're gonna practice and practice and practice wow. until we get it right. Um, then we have the ability to at a very, uh, or at, let me, let's just say at a higher level to be able to make the kind of transfers, emotional and otherwise, um, that you want to take place in any kind of art, in the theater, in dance, in opera, all of these things boil down to the same sort of equation is, you know, the singer is going to sing something and they have to know their range and what they're capable of and the material has to be right for them and then something happens. And, and that's what I'm, I mean, enthusiasm is a really good word because it, it is an animating human principle. In Greek, it means God in us. It means God in us. And it means that we're looking and we're searching for something bigger than ourselves that may just be what happens when I work together with Winton and we argue and we fight or we something com something's produced by that heat. And man, there's nothing better than that. There's nothing better than that. And it is a discipline. There are sacrifices and there are losses as well as victories and accomplishments. But, but this is the only way the only way you just got to keep going forward and doing it and and you know it's not the particular film it's not the particular scene it's not anything other than all of these things represent an opportunity to practice and practice implies that you are getting better you're in pursuit of happiness you haven't got there you're looking for a more perfect union that's what it's all about discipline right. and dedication and and also I think an important thing that he he's he's he just he just brought up he had a discipline and a dedication, but I'm gonna go back to what he was saying about recognition and the and the and the fact of a, of a kinship. And that uh I, I'm gonna give you give you a good example of a story. Normally at Jazz at Lincoln Center, I, I put the shows together. So I'm always the production team is always saying, Well, what is this gonna be? Is this gonna be on time? And I put them together and they're always kind of loose, you know. It's, Maybe they work out, maybe they don't. So we were, we were getting ready to do our show and they were saying, well, what is this? What is I said, don't worry. Who's gonna walk in here in a few minutes? The entire show is gonna be fine. <laughs> so when he came in, the entire show is written out, put together. I mean, that's, he, he's on top of it. And I think to go with what he's saying is that the burden is, is, is your burden is lighter when you understand you're not alone. And uh, the Florentine Films crew is fantastic. I love Jeff Ward. It's like, it's, it's, it's been like a father, a mentor to me for all these years. I go to his house every Sunday and, and Lynn. And I mean, when I see them, I feel great because they're a crack team, they're fantastic. And I think that as we've worked together uh, on, on different things and not just things that I'm even a part of, even the great Doug Womble is a, a fantastic guitarist that's played on, on a lot of uh, Ken's films. 
he's a, a, a country boy from Memphis, plays in that, in that, in that Anglo-American folk tradition, can play the blues, all Southern music. We're interpreting the same material from different perspectives. And the more of us that can get around the subject, the clearer we can be. And uh, Exactly right. Can, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, I, I just think that Carla, that, that even that we're here, in this magnificent library represents the kind of kinship that Winton's talking about. What, what is a library but a place to share these things that we have worked hard and sacrificed and, and figured out? And, and, it, and this is what makes this ideal. You know, I remember when Isaac Bashevis Singer died, the great uh, writer who, you know, helped rev rescue Yiddish. And, and, so, and you know, he, he wondered aloud to some reporter before he died, like, why would a Japanese man be interested in his stories of the shtetls of Eastern Europe a thousand years ago, unless he said they spoke about the kinship of the soul. And that's, really? that's, what, that's what it is. You realize that we are in a, an, an, an environment right now in which division and dialectic cell, it rules, right? Everything is binary. Everything's red state, blue state, black, white, gay, straight, young, old, rich, poor, north, south, east, west. I mean, and none of that matters. In fact, we are 99.99% exactly the same. And so the things that we do that connect that and to remind that, it's, I'm not talking about sugar-coated. This is not morning again in America. They're not like just violin strings for the sake of some emotional effect. But if we are speaking to a larger and deeply complicated whole, then you have a chance to bring everybody along. You bring everybody along. That's what Marty does. That's what Winton says Marty does. You know, that's what, he does do that. that's what we're trying to do. This is what, what it happens. And, and you, all of a sudden you go, oh, wait, I thought I didn't like country music. Mm -hmm. oh, I know this already. This is, this is a favorite song. Oh, I'd never heard that song, but this is country music. I, I, I really like this. Or, oh man, the jazz, you can't, you can't get me near jazz. It's, it's too complicated. It, you know, whatever. Oh, that's jazz? <laughs> oh man. Right. I'm tapping my two and my toes in a way that's totally, totally different than anything else I've I've tapped before. I mean, I, I'm a child of R and B and rock and roll, and I went into the jazz thing going, "Oh, please, please, please be kind to me." And you know, I came out, and that's that's what I listen to. That's what, and all kinds of it, all different kinds, ecumenical in every respect, and and that's what it. That's that's part of the the sharing too is just finding. And so Yo-Yo comes in and plays on Vietnam. And this person, Doug Wombo, comes in and plays and adds something. And you just say, we, we are happy to get it from anywhere and everywhere if people are going to have that kind of um, intention. Right. And history can play a part in that. When you're doing your film, then you're talking about the history of jazz or you're exploring the history of country music. The synergies and the African-American aspect of country music went, was a surprise to a lot of people. Well, that's because in our country, for some reason, well, it's, not, it's not for some reason, we all know it. Racism is gonna be served first. You have, you, have, you have something that's on the table and you're gonna figure out what you're gonna eat. And the one thing that you're gonna make sure you put front and center is going to be race division, racism. You go through the history of American music and you, you pick, take any of these great figures you want. The question, you're gonna always run into this, to this subject. What are we gonna do about the presence of the black person? How are we gonna make that person be less than they are? Because there's a fundamental question. If these people were created, a, a subculture in this country to be peons and they were created that way, and, and all of the, 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 the challenges <clears throat> that they face uh, from a human standpoint are because of their condition, we are at fault. If these people are just depraved as people, what happened was okay. That's, they deserve that. That's at the bottom of a lot of the conversations we have. That's why a black fool is always put in a position of importance. You show me some black, a black person that's willing to take pressure out of this system by saying, oh, nothing is wrong. I don't see what's going on and everything is cool. Or put, put the black face makeup now. It's like whatever the gear is of the moment, a grill or whatever it is, unlimited resources for that. 
somebody trying to say something intelligent, make a point, actually do battle with the forces that be, there's a problem. Now, that problem is not with the fans of Ken Burns films. That problem is not with America. Many times that is a problem that shows up in the cultural elite. So now you have a problem because you, you want to vilify one group of white people. You want to say, well, it's only the Klansmen, it's only this or that. <laughs> you had a better chance with them because they're not educated in this way of thinking. They, they, their response to stuff is very, now Ken may not agree with what I'm saying. So I'm, this, I'm, I'm representing my own oh. thoughts. I'm not going to say I'm representing them because you know, we, we, we think a lot the same, but we have some things that are a little different, which, which, which is as it is, no problem. Uh, well, another thing about he and, but, but when we talk, sometimes, or even when we've worked together, there's been things he didn't like. I might've really worked on it. He said, man, I don't like this. The one thing I respect the most about the dialogue that I've had with him across these years, we're not children, we're adults. So when we get to a point that we don't agree or we don't like something, we do, our, our relationship, our friendship, it's not, it's not going to be over, over a trivial thing. Right. We're going to survive a, a reality. So I'm, I'm only, I'm going to conclude what I'm saying just by saying, uh, you know, the racial thing is a part of the American identity. It occupies an, an unbelievably large space. He said that in his films to a lot of criticism and critique and, and from the very beginning, it's a fact, it's there, it's in our constitution, it's in everything we look at. And it's, it's, it was there last night in the presidential debates. It's there. It's there where we are. And I think the Library of Congress is full of material that shows that. <laughs> Quite a bit. And, it's, it's, and Ken, you seem to find, and it's been said uh, recently, that there's hope in history. I, I think and there is. By telling those stories in history. Well, I, I think what happens is, is that we begin to understand that history doesn't repeat itself, which is the common cliche. Mark Twain is supposed to have said that history doesn't repeat <laughs> itself, but it rhymes. And that, that, that sounds great. And, and I know that Winton would like that because so much <laughs> rhymes. Right, and, right. And, and what happens when you make these films is you realize, oh yeah, we've been here to a similar, not exactly the same thing, but all of these impulses. The Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. That's the Old Testament, which tells you that human nature doesn't change. And so what we're dealing with is the complexity of human nature superimposing itself on the seeming random unfolding of events. And so you begin to perceive um, durable, evergreen American themes that you can draw on. And obviously race is one of them. I mean, we can't be founded on the idea that all men are created equal. We hold these truths to be self-evident. The guy who writes it owns 200 human beings. Right then and there, you've got dissonance. Right then and there, you've got contradiction. Right then and there, you have undertow. And all we try to do is not try to bring it up for its sake, but say it's just there. And if you ignore it, then you're essentially still paying the fool to do your or dancing for you to put on a kind of you know metaphysical blackface and and do all this stuff and that 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 doesn't wash with me at all and so we've had complicated conversations about race and reminded us, you know, we put African American history in our schools into February, which is the coldest and the shortest <laughs> and the darkest. <laughs> and like I know why it's there. Um, yeah. but, but you know, and it's it, it, it's okay. But man, it's every single day. It's the burning heart of us, both the US and us. And if we don't recognize it, then we're in a whole big pile of trouble and you just have to confront it and, and and you know Winton said this in jazz it's like something you don't want to deal with you know you always want to avoid the con the thing that requires you to confront it and you just don't want to do it and yet our obligation the thing that we recognize in each other as as two men just working trying to get things done and what we recognize in a larger sense about the purpose of stuff where the country's going is that you just do have to confront it and you can't confront it with the old tropes, either of minstrelsy or of the clan or of all this sort of stuff. You just have to go and, 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 and measure it and say, here's what we look like as human right. beings. And, and the thing that is positive about history is that you do feel because we've gotten out of other sticky situations that we can do it again. And that history is um, a rising road. And so, you know, for however bad it is, you feel like it's, it's going to get better. It can get better, but it only requires that work and that discipline. 
And when, uh, before we go, I have to ask you in terms of history and some of the themes that we've talked about, you're from New Orleans and talk yes. about a complicated history and how did that help you have an appreciation of some of the themes and what Ken is saying about confronting things, being part of something that's a true gumbo, I think. Well, a great deal because of my parents. I know your parents are both musicians. Yes. So, you know, you grew up, you know what it's like. And my, my parents were very conscious. And uh, for me, a lot of just, just having them be on that, the level of consciousness that they were on. Of course, New Orleans, we have the history that we have. And um, I just I just want to want to want to co-sign what Ken is saying. You know, the 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 fact of 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 us having to constantly reinvent how we're gonna attack age-old problems, even before the even past the United States, right. and humanity and and the wanting to, to use people's labor for, for, and not pay them for it and concubinage and, and, and co co monetary corruption. These things are as old as dust. And uh, we just keep coming up with different ways to express our collective humanity and to address the problems that exist through that expression in our time. And that's why we're fortunate to be here today. I'm glad to talk to y'all. You know, I love my brother, Ken. And uh, I look forward to seeing you call and talk with you about your about more of that swinging music. That's right. Well, thank you both for this wonderful conversation. I think we're all the better for it. Yes, thank you, Carla. Yeah, you're right.